Now, one of the things I brought up, and you hear atheists say a lot, um, maybe not a lot, but there's a certain type of atheist who will say semi-consistently, semi you know, of course I don't believe in God, I don't have a choice. I don't have a choice in the things I believe. But that's not really true, okay? And especially when, when, you, when you are talking about, in depth psychology there's a phenomenon, okay? Things that are, there are certain types of emotions in depth psychology that they've studied and they understand are largely volitional. Uh, the examples would be anxiety, fear, anger, joy, hope. What makes it interesting, particularly in the, the case of anger, we'll use that as the example because it's most obvious there. People who experience those anger, or those, those emotional states, don't necessarily acknowledge or fully acknowledge or fully embrace the idea that they are volitional, but they are in fact volitional. Anger is the perfect, perfect one to, to show you what I mean. Most people who get angry act as if the anger is something that was visited upon them. Oh, I just got angry. I had no choice in the matter. When well, it's all volitional or volition plays a huge part in it. It's the difference between an angry person and a not angry person. Some people understand the mechanisms by which they can control themselves and the angry person acts like they can't, but in fact they could. There, there was uh, somebody said, was some, one of these sermons, somebody said, you know, you, they, someone made a case in point. If your pastor walked in here right now, you could shut up and control yourself immediately because you, you, it's, it's more volitional than you are willing to admit. If you've ever seen an angry person, you know how this drill works. I myself, for example, um, you're really angry, crying, you shout at the sun all the time. I'm shouting, not shouting in my videos. You're really angry, you're shouting in your videos all the time. Um, I, for example, in real life, I have never, ever, ever, as far as I can remember in the last 25 years or so, never get into altercations with like a busboy or the person who, you know, behind the counter or things like that. I can't, I can't ever think of a time when that happened. Now, why is the question? Because there's a power imbalance there. Okay, the only time that I actually get angry is when threat is involved. And that's usually in a healthy person, that's the only time anger should actually rear its ugly head. It's a fight or flight mechanism, you know. Some if we're walking down the street and someone disrespects my wife, pff, oh yeah, I'll get angry. <laughs> Other than that, though, I'm pretty mellow. And in a situation with like a busboy or, you know, someone working behind a counter, there's a total power imbalance. That person is no threat to me whatsoever. So I've, oh, I can't think of any time I've ever gotten mad at them. Why is that the perfect example? Because that's exactly the reason why the angry person abuses those people. The bus boy. If you get mad at the bus, you do this, do this emotional check right now. Check yourself right now. You've been in fights with bus boys. You probably have projected that it was them, but it probably wasn't. I mean, I'm sure a bus boy spilled water on me and some. Maybe I'd get mad if it was hot coffee. <laughs> Maybe then I'd yell at the bus boy. You know, because he's an idiot, but outside of that, I'm sure a busboy has spilled water on me or something. I never got mad. Why? Because there's a power imbalance. That's the exact reason why other people do get mad, because they can get mad and get away with it. Why? Because there's a power imbalance. You're not going to get mad at your boss. Why? Because there's a power imbalance. He'll fire you. He'll throw you out the door. But you can get mad at a busboy and beat up on a busboy. And if you find yourself doing it, the person always projects the, the, the altercation onto the, to the other person. Like it was an offense done unto them. Well, it's just not true. I mean, it might be technically true, but it's not true. That same person will go, you know, get into an altercation with the busboy. Go, go down the street, go to, go to the deli, get into, uh, get into a fight with the deli person. You know, then go go home and get into a fight with his wife. The whole time thinking, God, everybody's such a jerk but me. <laughs> you wonder, what, wonder what the through line is there. Wonder what the, the, the magic ingredient that, that is connecting all those dots. It's you. You're an angry person. That's how you know. If you get in fights with people who are powerless, the reason you're doing that psychologically is because you can. You're working your, your crap out on them because you can get away with it. And if any of you ever worked or a busboy, you'll know I'm telling you the truth. Go, uh, once, once upon a time... Maybe 30 years ago at this point, I was a, what was I, a barista in New York. Not in New York City. Oh, thank God. No, just in the New York area, which is bad enough. You know, people come in and they're trying to work their stuff out on you. And you every fifth person is trying, is trying to fight with you over nothing. 
And they're trying, they'll pretend it's you the entire time, but it isn't, it's them. You know, you may have technically done something wrong, but that person is totally volitional. They could easily control themselves and take a chill and relax, and they don't. They don't want to. So it's volitional. And if those types of emotional states are volitional, the ones I mentioned at the beginning, fear, anger, anxiety, those are heavily connected to religious beliefs. You don't believe me? Go watch an Aaron Ra video. Go watch an Aaron Ra video. You, all you need to do is mention Christianity or religion. Rah, rah, don't even get me started on Christian. Rah. You guys have no evidence. It's like magic beads. It's like magic potions. <laughs> There's zero rational response to it. It's all emotional. And it's all angsty and emotional and volitional. All of it. And if you, that's where we have the, the, the what, what is it called? Not the myth, but the, 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 ang the archetype of the angry atheist. Even atheists will tell you, well, I used to be an angry atheist. Now, sometimes there's a legitimate reason for that. Okay, some of the people will tell you, you know, I was raised in this fundamentalist tradition and I felt like they were all lying to me and I got played to some degree or another. And I kind of accept that. Having listened to enough of these tales, you kind of perceived it correctly. Yeah, you were, you were getting played to a certain degree. Now, the main difference in fundamentals, Christianity, an American version of it, and I guess the Canadian version is very similar, is very weird. It's very different than other religions. Catholicism has been around for 1,500 years, and it operates differently, even strict Roman Catholics. I remember noticing this back in the day. When I was 15 years old, there were, I, I didn't know any evangelical Christians. There were none in where I grew up. I grew up in a suburb of New York City, Westchester County, very liberal, very secular community. There was no such thing as an evangelical Christian. Tons of Catholic school kids. Tons of them. And what I noticed is they were basically... See, Catholicism, even, even though these were strict, basically strict practicing Catholics, Catholicism was offering them a degree of psychic freedom that you didn't find in fundamentalism. In fundamentalism, they don't just expect you to believe it. They expect you to act uh, upon it in secret. They try and boogie, get a boogeyman deep inside of you so that you don't do some of the things that are quote-unquote off-limits. In Catholicism, they go, this is off limits, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Don't touch a wiener. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Oh my God, I touched my wiener. Okay, go to church and confess. Nobody, nobody has like an emotional meltdown like that wasn't part of the plan. It wasn't supposed to go down like that. But in strict, you know, stricter forms of fundamentalism, they actually say, "Don't touch a wiener." Expect that a fifteen-year-old boy, old boy, isn't going to. It's not very realistic, but then they try to put a very a deep boogeyman inside the person so that they actually don't. <laughs> they wrestle with all these like, you know, it doesn't work like that. Even in strict Roman Catholicism, there is some sort of negotiation with reality itself, how teenagers are wired in the real world out there, and there's some sort of psychic space that they give to the people even in a strict version of it. So it's a lot healthier to some degree. But Catholics will tell you it's not a put guilt trip on. They'll have, they have their whole song and dance traumatized by religion routine too. It's just not as plausible. <laughs> it's really not. I listen to a Catholic sometimes. It's not as plausible. Um, it's semi-plausible with the fundamentalists. It's nowhere near to the degree that they say it is, but I, I get it to some degree and I buy it. Because that's what's going on. Fundamentalism isn't content to just tell you, you know, tiss, 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 don't do this. They try to actually get deep inside of you so you don't do it, <laughs> which is really different than other types of religion. The other types of religion would say, tiss, 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 don't do it, but to kind of understand, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, you're a kid, you can do stupid things, it's part of the process. And fundamentalism, they don't seem to quite, they don't seem to quite process that out correctly. So, the long and the short of that whole little, little aside is that you may have legitimate reason to be angry. I'm not questioning your anger being raised fundamentals, really not. I'm just telling you that anger is a volitional response. And it doesn't always seem like it is, but it is. That's my point. That's how I started this whole thing. So it doesn't always seem like you're not believing in God is a choice, but in fact, that's a whole, there's a whole reason why that's borderline ridiculous. Only in the rarest of circumstances. Okay? I'm borderline ridiculous, not you. To, the, the, the thing you think, not you, relax. It, only in the rarest of circumstances is there such a thing as I, I have no choice when it comes to beliefs. Beliefs are almost always volitional. 
Do you think a flat earther has no choice in the matter? There's, not, there's no agency involved? Uh-huh. Okay. So there's almost always agency involved. The rare exception is in the positive. Like when I went to church the first time, and I actually had experience that I really honestly thought was God, that's, you don't really have a choice. You have to go with what you, what, what your senses are directly telling you. You don't have a choice. And it doesn't mean I was right and that was God, but only in the positive do you not have a choice. In the negative, which the atheist would be, think, of, think about how illogical this would be. I ask you, do you believe in Bigfoot? And you go, no, I don't. I have no choice. Well, that's ridiculous. You've been to every, you've been all over the country and you've examined every area and every square foot and you've watched all the videos. No, the idea that you can have no choice in the negative is ludicrous. That's what I meant. It's a ridiculous idea. Do you believe in Bigfoot? You can say, no, I don't necessarily believe in Bigfoot, but you can't say Bigfoot does not exist. I have no choice except to, in the matter. You haven't you know, you haven't gone through every ounce of forest in the United States of America. And you haven't watched every documentary. Now, here is the, here is the only time where no choice would actually be involved. Because sometimes the direct evidence to your senses, um, the, 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 what you directly experience is intense and vivid and real enough to override your innate skepticism. So let's say you're walking through a forest and you're kind of agnostic on whether Bigfoot exists, exists or not. You may even call yourself an a Bigfootist. But you come into a clearing and there's this eight-foot hairy creature in front of you and you know for a fact you're seeing it because it stays there for north of an hour. And why it doesn't eat your face? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, Bigfoot's, Bigfoot, maybe Bigfoot got a bad rap. He's more peaceful than people realize. It's, 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 I'd say run, sure. I'm going to run, Craig. Yeah, I would say run too, but... For some reason, this particular, this particular type of Bigfoot is very, very, you know, he's got a bad rap over the years. He's mellow. He's just sitting there. He's not, he's not arming you. But it's an eight-foot creature, and it's hairy, and you're sure it's not an orangutan, and you're sure it's not a bear. And it's 100 feet away from you, so you're absolutely positive you see it. It stays there for north of an hour. At that point, your experience of an actual should, and kind of you have no choice, is what I mean. Is the only thing I'm trying to point out with this little thought experiment you have no choice at that point the your experience of the actual thing that you are seeing with your own eyes has to to some degree override your innate skepticism so whatever you might have thought about bigfoot prior to seeing him you are now a bigfoot believer hallelujah bigfoot is real craig hallelujah thank you bigfoot <laughs> you now believe in him you have no choice that's the only time when something directly confronts you, that's the, tip, the type of thing atheists are talking about. You know, God knows what it would do to convince me, as if God owes you some sort of special favor. <laughs> He's, you know, it's just a weird concept. Atheists say this, he knows what it would take to convince me, and he hasn't done it. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Like, like he's really like troubled by, you know, Matt Gelant, he still doesn't believe in me. Oh my God, this is getting bad, guys. <laughs> like, you know, the idea of it is kind of nonsensical. It's funny. It's, I've heard him say that a lot. Yeah, God does know what it would take to convince you. And maybe the, the only point I'm trying to make. Okay. I'm getting a little, getting a little ahead of myself. Starts to happen. I start to have fun making these videos and forget what the whole point was. Um, the point I was originally trying to make. Okay. The Bible clearly says, seek and you will find. If your admonition to figure out if Bigfoot were real were seek for Bigfoot, you know, you could, you could never say, I have no choice to not believe in Bigfoot. Why? Because Bigfoot could exist somewhere, and in principle, you just never stumbled upon the thing that would convince you that he's real. You know, and you, you could go listen to some people's testimonies, and maybe those people are crackpots and not convincing. But theoretically, there could be three people that you haven't asked who would give you really convincing testimony. And, you know, this one guy's got this girl, Bigfoot ate her face. <laughs> and yeah, my daughter got her face ate, eaten by Bigfoot. Wow, that sucks. <laughs> you got any evidence? <laughs> yeah, there's her face. It's totally eaten off. Um, so, the, theoretically, Bigfoot could exist in principle. So, you can't say with, with, a, with a negative, I have no choice. The whole idea is, ir is illogical, deeply illogical. And if you've said, I have no choice, that should give you pause about yourself. Why? Because you kind of want to not believe. 
Because that's not a rational thought process, not a logical follow through thought process. I don't believe in Bigfoot. I have no choice, even though I haven't walked through the entire, you know, North American countryside, I have no choice. You have a choice. You can be agnostic on Bigfoot. You know, I don't have any good reason to believe, barring further evidence, which is the whole conversation that people keep trying to say, which is more agnostic. And people trying to say that that's atheist, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother can of worms that I'm not going to open in this particular conversation. You could be agnostic about it, but you can't say I have no choice. There is no such thing as I have a, no choice for a negative belief. The whole idea of it is illogical. And if you recognize that the subject of Christianity religion is deeply emotional and deeply emotional in, de in depth psychology, according to depth psychology, in those emotional spaces that are actually really volitional, fear, anger, anxiety, hope, joy, those are really volitional emotional res responses. Now, there are degrees of how, like, triggered out and how neutral an atheist could possibly be. On the one hand of the spectrum, you have Aaron Ra. Not, a, not rational. His responses when the subject of Christianity and religion comes up are deeply irrational. He would never be, if they put it this way, I've said this in other videos, it's worth thinking about. If there were a person on trial that was a Christian, he would never be allowed on the jury. They'd throw him out of the... So show one minute of him foaming at the mouth about Christianity from any video anywhere, and they go, no, we can't have that guy on the jury. So nobody would trust his opinion. Why? He's too emotionally involved. He's too emotionally involved. He's too wrapped up in his emotions to parse the, uh, the, the evidence out correctly or even examine the evidence properly or even trust himself to put, steer himself towards the right evidence. Too much emotion involved. On the other end of the spectrum, you have someone like Shannon Q or probably better examples, objectively Dan, who you can at least have a rational and reasonable conversation with about, you know, your Christian belief or religion, and, you know, Shannon will foam at the mouth very little. Not, not, not never, but very, very little. Dan probably never. You know, that's part of his thing. But I don't, Drew, possibly Drew too. There are people out there who are trying to the best of their ability to, to correct for their own confirmation bias and try and actually be a neutral third-party observer when it comes to the question of does God exist or does not exist. Probably be more appropriate to call themselves agnostic, who in principle think God might exist, but that's another story for another day. There are people who are in principle out there and their behavior shows. Those are generally speaking, um, Shannon's kind of an a little bit evangelical, but generally speaking, less evangelical-minded atheists. They're less about trying to, you know, bring other people into the fold of atheism. So you understand that, right? Now with those people, it's a little more plausible, but the idea that it is not volitional is suspect. That's my point. It's deeply volitional. It is tied to your deep-seated emotional responses. Everything that you think, you know, do, your, do, your, do this own check on yourself. Can I have a reasonable conversation with you about Christianity? And are you going to get, is there going to be a trigger point? Are you even temporarily, there's some people who are a angry atheists and there's some people who are angry atheists for, you know, they're fine until you get on one subject and then, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> all right, we won't talk about that particular aspect of Christianity. And then they start foaming at the mouth like Aaron Ra. But do you sound like Aaron Ra ever? And if you do, are you able to shake it off sometimes and have, a, can somebody have a normal conversation with you about Christianity where you actually seem somewhat reasonable and objective and aren't just trying to like debunk, dismiss, discredit them, just trying to listen. So, okay, that's your point of view, man. I, I understand. I feel you, bro. <laughs> I don't really think God exists. There's no good evidence. Give me some good evidence. And can you be trusted to parse out that evidence correctly? Remember, the Bible says, seek and you will find. Most atheists will tell you, I did see. Yeah, I'm not talking about 15 years ago, once upon a time, when you were a Christian. I'm talking about right, it means seek, present tense. Volitional. Seek is volitional. You understand that, right? Seek is volitional. When most atheists say seek, what they do with their daily behavior is entirely volitional. You do understand that too. That's not choice, right? That is choice, I mean. Volitional. Choice. Agency. Okay. 
When the, when the Bible says seek and you will find, seek is entirely volitional. Clicking on an atheist video is not seeking. You understand that, right? And that is a choice. And that choice is going to guaranteed almost, almost completely, 100 times out of 100, reinforce the way you're already leaning. It's not going to challenge what you deep, your deep-seated belief. It's going to help you reinforce it. And that's choice, volitional. You understand that, right? That there is a way that you could steer yourself so it be far more likely that you could, could, would conclude or at least hedge your bets that God in fact exists just based on the choices you make in the next month. What to click on and what not to click on. That it's all volitional to some degree or another. You do recognize that, right? Because if you don't recognize that, then you can't trust you. That's my point. Aaron can't trust him when it comes to these type of things. That's why he would not be picked for a jury pool. Why? Because he, nobody would think ever, ever in a million years think that he's objective on the subject. Why? Is it too much emotional investment? It's too obvious. If you're an atheist, I'm not saying you're right or wrong, okay? Don't, don't read this wrong. You do you. I'm just saying, for your own edification and to harness and polish up your own critical thinking skills, which you seem to think are first rate, and I find that proposition dubious. I really do. And I've talked to a lot of atheists. You seem to think they're first rate. You applaud, you applaud your critical thinking skills all the time. I find them suspiciously weak, but that's for another day. You owe it to yourself to ask yourself that real question. Can I be trusted? Do I steer myself in a direction where I am more likely to reinforce what I already concluded a long time ago, 15 years ago, for reasons that were kind of even, according to you, emotional? Tell the truth. Kind of even, according to you, emotional. Tell the truth. I, this is between you and me. We aren't debating. I don't know who's listening. Just telling you, tell the truth to yourself. Did you de deconstruct from a church that was fundamentalist in nature? Again, I, I applaud that to some degree. You probably did the right thing. Those people were probably trying to get a boogeyman inside of you, and they you know, apologize, fundamentalist, but deal with it. You guys are the low man on the totem pole in terms of Christians, and, you know, eat it. You, you earned it. <laughs> eat it. You earned it. You did. I'm talking to my friend. I'm talking to my people, the atheists, my people, <laughs> my friends, the atheists. If you deconstructed from a church, you recognize that there's deep-seated emotional reasons why you did that. It might have been the right thing to do, probably would applaud it, I probably agreed with you. But that doesn't mean there isn't emotional, volitional emotions involved. Emotions that are deeply volitional in nature that don't get experienced by the conscious agent as volitional. Nobody ever, no angry young man has ever described himself as an angry person. Even when I was an angry young man once upon a time. Everyone thinks I'm angry now because I shout at the sunshine. I, I accept that. I'm not actually, not actually shouting and I'm not technically shouting at the sun. Um, just happens to have worked out that way. Once upon a time, I was an angry young man. No, almost no angry young man, no angry person has the introspective capabilities to understand that they are, in fact, that it is volitional. That's my only point. If you ever... Go into angry atheist mode, even temporarily, and you caught yourself doing it. I applaud you for catching yourself doing it. Some people are self-aware. That's pretty self-aware. I'm not kidding. I applaud you for that. That's, that's called integrity. But that means that you have an agenda and a dog in the fight. That's all. Be aware of it. That's all. I'm not telling you good, bad, right, wrong. I'm just telling you it is. And it is there. And the idea... That that is not volitional to some degree is highly suspect. That's my point. If you're going to be a true skeptic, okay, a true, there's a difference between a skeptic and a wise human being. A wise human being is skeptical about themselves. They catch themselves in their own agendas. I've been doing that to myself for years. Years. And I'm really good at it. Really good at catching myself when I'm, I know I'm kind of playing myself. I don't do it all that much. I do it less than anybody I know. But I still do it. Everybody does it. Are you playing yourself to some degree? Are you deliberately reinforcing, you know, something that you decided once upon a time, long time ago, mostly based on emotional reasons? Let's get real. Let's tell the truth. Mostly based on emotional reasons, deep-seated emotional reasons. Again, that are probably true. 
not denying the feelings involved and I'm not denying that you had the number of that particular group of people that you were connected to. They were trying to play you to some degree. I've heard enough of these stories. That is correct analysis. I accept that. All I'm telling you is that was then and this is now. Seek and ye will find is an immediate... Uh, not command. It's not really command. <laughs> Command's the wrong word. It's a command. Great. No, it's not. It's seek and it's immediate. It's an immediate admonition. It's an admonition based in the here and now. Seek and you will find. Do you understand? I admit that was a little rambly and long-winded, but some of that was really on point and really good and really worth hearing. As with all my videos, the reason why I let myself just kind of emote <laughs> and, and talk and feel and be is because sometimes I get at things that I couldn't get at any other way. You know, I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody. There, we all understand that there's the archetype or the, the angry atheist, right? We all get that. So most of the atheists that I deal with are self-aware enough to know that there's a, 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 um, a, you know, a stock figure out there known as the a angry atheist. Most of the atheists I deal, deal with are not that stock figure because they have enough self-awareness. But they also have enough self-awareness to go, you know, I was at one time when I first deconverted because I was mad that I got lied to. They have a whole narrative that they tell themselves. And I think that narrative is pretty much true and on point. That's my only point. But if you're that self-aware, then go the whole nine yards and really, really seek. Um, let's see if I'm running out of time. Seek, the, as the good book says, I will be found of you when you seek with me with seek for me with all of your heart. Now I've heard somebody say, I swear to God, I heard atheists say, see, that's confirmation bias. That's not that's not how to interpret that scripture. That's very poor critical thinking skills. Sometimes your critical thinking skills, here's how you can tell the difference. If you, there's propaganda and there's critical thinking, propaganda is forever and always the enemy of critical thinking. If you are telling yourself a narrative because it helps to, to, telling yourself something because it helps to construct a narrative that's propaganda, that's not critical thinking skills, they're the opposite. Propaganda is the enemy of critical thinking, it makes you dumb. And if you're clicking on atheist links, you are trying to reinforce a narrative. I'm not saying don't do that ever, I'm just saying be aware of what you're doing when you do it. That ain't seeking. Seeking when you, uh, why will be found of you when you seek for me with all of your heart is not confirmation bias. It's not even close. It means be who you really are. And really, like how I hear it is cry out to God from the depth of your being. It doesn't mean in some sort of fake religious way where you're like, this is what a, I would have said when I was a Christian, or this is what a Christian should say, you know, stupid. Even Christians do those fake type of prayers. I mean, cry out. Say what's really in your heart. Really in your heart. Be on, as honest as humanly possible. Nobody's there watching you. You know, if, if you're saying something as pained and emotional as, you know, why did you let, why did you let my mother beat me? You, blankety blank. That's what's really there, then that's what's really there. Be honest. I've had moments like that. Not beaten by my mother, God forbid. No, my mom, my mom is a sweetheart. But you know what I'm saying. So anyways, yeah, I'll wrap it up a little. A little, little rambly, but I think mostly on point. I'll go back into this again. I'm getting somewhere with this. Once I get this up and running somewhere good, I think it'll really fly. I really do. I really think it's close to nailing it right there precise. So, there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.